Good day, fellow deal makers. Welcome to the Deal Scout. On today's show, we're going to talk about building tech companies and investing and all sorts of cool stuff with my friend Jared. Jared, welcome to the show. Hey, man. Thank you for having me, Josh. I love what you stand for. I love what this show is about. And uh, I'm an open book. So ask me anything. I want to be of service to your community. Heck yeah. All right. So we're going to be talking about deals and we're going to share the story of the deal maker. So kind of give us an idea, you know, high level. What are you doing? What kind of deals do you do? What do you do? Yeah, so I, I had this realization um, a couple of years ago that the most potential in the world resides in the graveyard. And I thought to myself, if I could find a way to intercept the potential before it goes to the graveyard, I could change the freaking world. And uh, I be- went on a mission to connect with entrepreneurs from literally everywhere, from mud huts in Africa to Miami, Florida, and everywhere in between that have great ideas that they've written on a piece of paper. I call them napkin ideas. And I'm on a mission to build, scale, and sell 10,000 tech companies with those entrepreneurs who originally have an idea on a piece of paper. And we help them turn that idea into a limitless scale tech company. And uh, it is very rewarding, Josh, because we have co-founders now literally from around the world, all of which are wonderful humans, but none of which would be executing on their biggest idea if our worlds didn't collide. Did I hear this right? You want to build scale and sell 10,000 tech companies. That is, that is correct. Yeah. And we have the infrastructure to do it. It's not a wish. So we, we've been doing this now. It's called Project 10K. It's a project to build scale and sell 10,000 tech companies over the next 10 years. We launched in June of 2020. In the first week, we co-founded seven tech companies. And my CTO said, you got to slow down. I'm like, no, dude, you got to speed up. We have 9,993 more to go. But I understood what he meant. We had to build an infrastructure because these are this is co-foundership. It's not a training program. It's not an accelerator. Like it's co-foundership. Like we become the product manager, the software development team, the copywriters, the graphic designers, the digital marketers, the video editors, the bookkeeping team, the legal team. So we weren't really built to do that. We just launched the company. So I gave the team a little bit of time to catch up. And then about 14 months ago, we we pushed on the gas. And since then, Josh, we've had over 16,000 entrepreneurs from around the world come through our process. And we've co-founded almost 140 companies in our first year. And that's co-foundership. That means there's no end to our process. The end is when we sell the company. And 140 in our first year is more remarkable than 10,000 in 10 years. Because this was the year to figure this thing out. Like, yeah. how do we scale our software development division, which predominantly is in a company in India that I've owned since 2017, and now we're opening up other markets. How do we scale go to market? What does copywriting look like at scale? How do you do bookkeeping for 140 companies, and then eventually 10,000? And that's what we figured out in our first year. But what I'm most proud of is this. We're not playing law of averages. It's not like if we launch enough companies, we get one or two winners. Everything we say yes to, we see a path to build, to scale, and to sell. All different levels of of valuation, but we see that path for each of the entrepreneurs. Holy moly. All right. So I can't wait to ask these kind of questions. You're your intake process and qualification process and you know sifting process must be crazy like 16,000 you said reached out to you correct yeah it's 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 remarkable what we've done cuz we're building the plane as we're flying it right yeah. like, it wasn't like i spent a year or two years like building it and they were like now we're ready i committed and then i'm like we'll figure out the details as we go cuz this was a calling so i'm a non-technical tech founder that found a way to scale a SaaS platform, software as a service, from zero users to now over 40,000 paying users um, in about four years. And I did every single thing you could do wrong in the process. I outsourced development to a software development firm in Boston, Massachusetts. They told me it would take 10 months and $750,000. It took two years and $2 million. And then I had to scrap it and start over. I had different strategic alliances that just didn't perform. And then what I realized was I have to own my territory. So I began to build my own dev team and that made all the difference. And that allowed me to build and scale this one tech company to over 40,000 paying users. And then I had this realization, if I could do it once, I have to do it 10,000 more times. And that became my moonshot. But with regard to the process, the intake is really cool. It starts with an initial application takes about 30 to 45 minutes to fill out the application. So that by itself filters people out that aren't serious. And, right. and there, there is no other way around it. Like you have to do the initial application. From there, we have an idea review committee 
that goes through these applications, which is really daunting. It's quite a bit of effort um, that they put into it. And what they're looking for are things that are, are relevant for what we do. We're not building spaceships yet. We will in the future. We're, we're building software. So it's SaaS products, it's marketplaces, it's social media platforms, it's it's the software behind AR, VR, it's AI, it's it's stuff using the blockchain. So we know what we're best at, and that will expand over time as well. So if it meets certain criteria, we then invite the entrepreneur to pitch us on our show. We have a daily show. It's called What's on Your Napkin, and uh, it's Shark Tank, but cooler. Shark Tank's awesome. I was actually with Kevin O'Leary yesterday. I, I love Shark Tank. But the one thing about Shark Tank is the majority of the entrepreneurs that are pitching, they're not pitching companies that are going to change the world. I mean, like, think about Scrub Daddy, Josh, right? Like, it's a sponge. Like, I mean, I, I'm happy that we have it because my pots are now clean. Like, there's no, like, like, like egg stuck on it. Like, that's cool. But it didn't change the world. It made $100 million. That's awesome. The stuff that we hear on our show, it is world changing. Like, it is crazy innovation. Industry technology, country technology, universal technology, enterprise level. I mean, it's really cool stuff. So they pitch it on the show. They have five minutes. We air it live. And our, the audience gets a chance to vote. In their pitch, we ask them 10 minutes of questions after. We'll decide whether or not we want to invite them into our due diligence process. The due diligence process is 60 to 90 minutes. There is an investment of capital because we want to know they're serious. They're coming with a napkin. So you got to invest. We want to know you have skin in the game because we have skin in the game. We're going to put four of our executives on the due diligence call for 60 to 90 minutes and then six other people after watching the replay and going through all the resources. Mm -hmm. We then debrief for two to three hours after everybody reviews it. And then we make a decision on whether or not we're going to move forward. What we're looking for is four major criteria, the right person, with the right idea in the right market and the right business model. If those four things are present, there's a lot of nuance to it. We will co-found a company with an entrepreneur. Yeah. So you said there's a, there's a pay to play in, in this. Have you met any resistance with that? What does that look like? Um, you know, what, what have you heard on the flip side of this? Cause you guys are building as you're going and due diligence, especially for executives and six people in the back end, that gets really expensive. It's funny you say this. So we have um, we've built a lot of relationships in the, in the venture community, uh, and uh, they don't have any pay to play. And yeah. they're like, "Wait, you're having people pay you to pitch you?" I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're like, "Do you know if we did that, we'd have another billion dollars in our fund?" I'm like, "Then you should have done it. Like, yeah. like you should have done it." No, we don't. And here's just the only time we will make certain exceptions is we'll have people in other countries that are pitching and economically it just makes it literally impossible for them and we stand to democratize technology give everyone a shot um so this is not a revenue stream for us like this is a come and take it serious stream for us like we don't really care about the money that's coming in it's a thousand dollars it's not changing anybody's life but because they are investing they yeah. show up seriously their deck is polished they're prepared they're sitting with the right light they're focused there was a point we didn't do this in the beginning and uh, people will be like laying in their bed. I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're one pitch away from being everything you want in your life and more, like show up. And yeah. then one day, someone on my team was like, they should pay a grand. I'm like, yeah, you're right, they should. And that was it. And since then we've not looked back. We make, we'll, we'll make exceptions here and there if someone's like really in a trying position. But for the most part, no, no, one, ever bail, no one ever bows out for that step. Um, if they believe in their idea enough, that's a really small investment to get to the point of what we're gonna super take. Super cool, super cool. Yeah, people, pay attention when they pay. Yeah. It is so true. I mean, a lot, I mean, it's like four executives, six other people. Like, like, I mean, we're losing money on a thousand bucks still. Like, like, but it's just, we're now not, like not losing the time because they yeah. do take it seriously when they're, when they're putting in that money. Yeah. Have you seen any pitches that like just absolutely blew your mind? You're like, why didn't anybody in this world think of this? Oh my, like almost every day. Like there's one now that we're building it like, it does just one thing. Like it's so basic. We have done so much market research on this. We can't find anything that does it. Like, and it shocks me that no one has built this before. And it's like a utility that every health professional will need. It's a platform that will reschedule last minute cancellations for, for health professionals. Yeah. So the co-founder is a dentist. She has a million dollar practice. And, uh, she was on a webinar that I was doing where I was empowering the audience to think about inefficiencies in their personal or professional life that are stealing time or money or preferably both. And she's like, whoa, that's bold. So she went to her team the next day in their team meeting and she goes, what's an inefficiency that's stealing our time and our money? And they're like, cancellations. 
She's like, how much money last year did we lose on, on, on canceled appointments that we weren't able to reschedule? And they said $100,000, $100,000 for that. Because a million dollar dental practice is really not that big. So uh, 10%, like, or she's losing wow. to cancellations. So we built a SaaS product that literally reschedules people and or fills emptiness in your calendar. And I'm like, how is this doesn't exist? And it, we've done so much research. And now I don't even care if it does because we have such a strong go-to-market strategy that uh, it's just going to take over dentistry, chiropractic, and, and other industries as well. Super cool. Super cool. Now, here's here's some, I have a thousand questions that we're going to have some fun talking about, but 10,000 businesses that you guys are co-founding. Like, bro, like that's, that's, that's massive, right? Like if, if you said, yeah, we're building a portfolio of a hundred companies, yeah, yeah. that's huge. 10,000, you're like, all right, is that even realistic? Like it, it seems so crazy. Where'd you come up with that number? It was a calling. So I was living in Westport, Connecticut uh, when, when COVID hit um, and I, it was April of 2020. And I officially became obsolete at my previous company that I started which was magical. It's like, it should be every entrepreneur's dream. Like I was actually getting in the way at this point. Like there was like nothing more I could have done. So I'm like, listen, you guys run it. Like I'm bowing out. Like I still own it. I, I gave equity to key people. So they have like ownership to make decisions. And then I'm thinking to myself, what's my next move? I'm 35 at the time, I had two young kids, happily married. We had a great life. I'm like, what's my next move? And I was just digging into it. And then all of a sudden I realized my next chapter's my moonshot. I'm going to do something that shakes up the world or I'm going to go down trying. And as I was thinking about it, I realized that eight years earlier, which is when I started the journey of being a non-technical tech founder, I committed to making the technology industry safe because I was so bruised and just taken advantage of by that software development firm. So I'm like, all right, this is my time to make the technology industry safe. How do I do that? Well, I'm going to do a moonshot. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna do what I just did with Synduit, but 10,000 more times by 2031. So that was it, it was a calling. And the one thing I know, Josh, is you can't negotiate your moonshot. So yeah. I'm like, we just gotta do it, we gotta get after it. So people ask me this all the time, They're like 10,000, how are you gonna do that? Well, there, there's, there's two answers to it. One, salesforce.com is 87,000 employees. So there's an example of someone that has done it. That's a lot of people, it's like a small country, but here's the real answer. In the next 10 years, do you think there'll be at least 10,000 tech companies that launch? And the answer is obviously yes, like at least, probably way more than that, right? So cool. So now the next question is, do you think an individual company has a greater chance of success on an island by itself or in an ecosystem of 9,999 others where everyone is sharing press, investors, relationships, and users, emotional support? And everybody's like, yeah, of course the ecosystem wins. I'm like, well, then there's my point. It, we're going to prove that it's easier to do what we're doing than being the individual tech founder on by yourself. Yeah. Super cool. Um, democratizing technology. What do you mean by that? So um, I stand against what big tech has evolved into for the most part. And Silicon Valley is an extremely pretentious place. If you don't have the right pedigree, skin color, gender, education, bank account, like you can't even buy a cup of coffee there. Like there's, there's just, there's just no space. And I just, I just stand against it. We have, we have this minute, this is unintentional, by the way, yeah. we have more women than men as founders. Um, we have every ethnicity represented. We have an 11 year old founder and we have a 77 year old founder, both first time tech founders. We did not say yes to the 11 year old cause he's cute. He's a cute kid, but he's a really great idea. We're democratizing it. What that means is we're giving everyone a shot. As long as you're the right person with the right idea and the right market, the right business model, we're giving you a shot. I don't care if you've been in jail. I don't care if you're a veteran. I don't care if you're a woman. I don't care if you're in, in Africa living in a mud hut. If you're the right person with the right idea and the right market and the right business model, we're co-founding a company with you. Silicon Valley won't say that. What kind of pushback are you getting from external forces, you know, from venture capital groups, private equity groups, big tech? Like, what kind of feeling are you getting uh, polarizing, like, against they, you guys? They can't wrap their mind, like, especially Wall Street. Like, Wall Street is probably where I'm getting the most pushback because they're like, but you're, they're napkins. They're, they're, they have no value. Like, so we've created an entirely new category for investors because napkins don't get funded. Like unless someone has a rich uncle, right? Like they don't get yeah. funded, right? Because they know whoever the rich uncle knows, I'm gonna give a hundred thousand dollars to little Johnny and he's gonna lose the money, right? Like they know that they're not gonna pull it off. The other part of the early stage world is like the prototype slash minimal cash flow 
it's like two or three dudes or women in a room that are programming and like they have something to show and they go and they raise at a higher valuation because they have something to show. And that's freaking risky because they're going to take a million bucks and then have to figure out how to spend it. Like they're not spending it on themselves. Like they're going to have to spend it on going out and finding talent. You know how hard it is to find talent? Like yeah. it's freaking difficult. Like, so that's a huge risk. We've created a whole new category because it is, I mean, it's, it's a napkin. Like it's, it's early. We know the exact use of every cent. We know exactly why we're bringing the product to market. We know exactly what we're building. We know the exact team. Like we are the infrastructure. Like Project 10K has hundreds of employees now. We are the infrastructure. We're the product manager. We're the software development team. We are the copywriter. We're the graphic designer. We're the sales force. We're the customer support. Like we are the team. So when somebody invests, it's a lower valuation because there isn't much to show yet, but it's mature infrastructure. It's an entirely new category for investors. So Wall Street like can't even get there. Like they're, they are so far from understanding it. The venture world is like, you pull that off, like you are going to disrupt entrepreneurship. Like it's just going to disrupt everything because who would not want to get involved at early, early stage, like our stage with mature infrastructure where I'm telling you, this is going to be like our internal secret within 18 to 24 months, we're going to prove it's easy to do what we're doing because of all the shared L aspects of our ecosystem. So as we prove out the life cycle of individual companies, billions of dollars is gonna flow through, trillions. Cause like who wouldn't wanna get involved with Slack when it was an idea on a piece of paper with the right infrastructure. I mean, that person would be worth billions of dollars today just by writing a $250,000 check. Yeah. So when you're, when you're building this, right? 10,000 businesses, how do you prevent competition within the ecosystem, right? Like you talk about the support and you talk about this like awesome deal ecosystem, right? Like how do you prevent creating two businesses that compete against each other or that feed off each other? Like, how do you do that? So, so, so I have this premise, which is commit and figure out the details later. We haven't had figured out that detail yet. So just because okay. we haven't been exposed to it yet. Yeah. So we will figure it out when it happens. And yeah. this is actually a really valuable lesson though, because what most people do is they have to figure out every detail before they commit. Yes. And that's why they have to have small goals. Because if I had to figure out every detail before I committed to building, scaling, and selling 10,000 tech companies, I wouldn't have started, right? There's just too many details. So a great lesson for all of you is just trust your instinct and commit and then just be one detail ahead of where you are. Because I'm always one detail ahead of where I need to be. And as a result, I'm ahead of the game. And I just need to keep on figuring out the details as we go, because there's just a lot of details. So I don't know what it looks like at four, five, six, seven thousand 7,000 companies. I know today we have some cool things happening because we have certain companies that are further along than others that have the exact same end users, but they're solving different problems for those end users. And it doesn't make sense for it to be one product. It would be, be like a complicated product. So that's really cool because the one that's further along, by the time the other one launches, might have 10,000 users, perfect strategic alliance. They're in the same ecosystem. And the one thing we tell all of our founders is that a win for Project 10K, even if it's not your company, is a win for all because it brings press, it brings attention, it brings assurance, security, like a win for Project 10K, even if it has nothing to do with your company, is a win for you because you can leverage that into something more. Yeah. So 140 companies within a year, like that's cool. Man, I've been working on the same, you know, one or two for over the year, right? So like you, really awesome work, man. Infrastructure is so important. You talk about some things that are, that most people, most investors or most entrepreneurs may not like put on the balance sheet or may not even have in their, in their mind. You said emotional support. And in a previous conversation, you and I, we talked about like 12 pillars of life. And you said for a group to work with us, they have to adopt and I'm giving you time to make sure you get all your 12, look them up, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? But you, you said you have, to, you have to buy into the whole picture, <coughs> all right? So like th this is something that is, you know, that, that's not a number, a one or a zero on a piece of paper or a code. What does that look like? What, do, what are the 12 and why is it important? So let me, let me take a step back. So this is actually really important. I was recently having a conversation with a, a friend of mine who's had many exits. And he said to me, um, what excites me most about you producing this outcome, because I've known him for a while, is that I know how you live your life. And if you become the example for every one of these entrepreneurs, 
you're going to create a new standard of entrepreneurship. Because like right now, when someone thinks entrepreneurship, they think grind, they think late hours, they think that their kids aren't going to know them, they think their spouse is like, they, that's like this like unfortunate image of entrepreneurship. And a lot of of successful influencers, that is their life, like where they start building traction and they, they have no relationship with their kids, their spouse divorces them, they then get remarried to somebody much younger. I'm not judging, but that is not what entrepreneurship is. Entrepreneurship is a path for freedom. Like that's what entrepreneurship is. And I do not believe that you have to give up on your highest values to produce more value. And I am now a shiny example of that for 140 freaking co-founders and will be 10,000 in the next 10 years. So I have this whole premise is if I don't have it all, I have nothing. I'm a black or white human. So there's only two, I only have two extremes. There's no gray in my world. So I have it all or I have nothing. So my all is I'm a dad to my, my five-year-old and three-year-old. I'm a husband, my health, my mental stability. Like, like my all is that entrepreneurship is to create more of that. So I have created the ultimate hook because everyone wants to be a tech founder. I mean, realize like the cool thing on the block used to be to become an athlete. We have four major MBA stars that are founders with us now. Like the cool thing was to be an athlete. Now athletes want to become founders of tech companies, right? So like we have the coolest offer in the world. Like you can become a tech founder. I'm just hooking people in to become tech founders with me because it sounds cool. But what I'm showing them is how to have it all. Because as much as I care, about building, scaling, and selling 10,000 tech companies in the next 10 years, what I care more about is who every individual person becomes on the journey. And if they get to their exit and their kids hate them and their spouse divorced them and they have an autoimmune disease because they weren't taking care of their body, I failed them. And I will not allow that to happen. So we have a very unique culture here. When everybody joins, whether it's a team member an investor into an individual company, an investor into our company, a co-founder, they have to sign our code. Our code, I guess you could call, is our core values. And it's an acronym for the word together because we say together we achieve more. And that's very important because of the foundation of what we do, it's all encompassing. Like when someone says, we say yes to them and they say yes to us, like they're saying yes to having it all, which freaks people out because most people don't feel worthy enough so we are breaking through those boundaries to say, no, this is your path to have it all. Because economics is part of having it all. Like it is part of it. Like money is an amplifier. If you're a piece of crap, it's just gonna amplify that you're a piece of crap. If you're a great human, it's gonna amplify you're a great human. You're a great human or you wouldn't be co-founding with us. We're gonna amplify that. <laughs> and you're gonna become an example for your significant other and for your kids and for generations to come. So I wanna make sure that's clear because we are creating like a, like a new image of entrepreneurship here. And the entrepreneurship image that we're creating is you will have it all. Your health, your children, your significant other, your adventure, your spirituality, the economics, like geographical freedom, like everything we do is remote. Like we, we don't have a physical office, like everything we do is remote. Like our India company is, is remote. That's very rare to do the way we've done this, like because that's geographical freedom, which is something that I value. Super cool. Out of the the twelve pillars, is there a place that we can you know download that or or view yeah, that? Is that I'll, online I'll somewhere? I'll give it to you. You can All just right. put it in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, we'll we'll put in the show notes. So make make sure you send that over. Good. But the the code, the core values. That that's interesting. That's, that too. I'm actually going to share that with you if you want to share that with your, your your audience. It's long. I mean, it's like thirty pages. Like, but I believe every single family and business needs something like this. What it does is it creates a common language. So we have a lot going on. Right? Like we have 140 companies, we have founders and like realize like the team that we assign to an individual company is their team, right? Like that's their team. So sometimes founders are like, you yeah, know, that's your team, Jared. I can't tell I'm disappointed in them. Like, like, I'm like, no, this is not a client vendor relationship. Like you're, we're co-founders. Like if they said they were going to do something, but they didn't do it the way you expected, you need to call them out on that and vice versa. Like, like I tell our team all the time, like, don't treat them like a vendor. Like, don't treat them like a client. I mean, like, like they're your co-founder. Like if they said they're going to write a blog post at two o'clock on Tuesday, and now it's four o'clock on Tuesday, you're going to call them out because like they're a co-founder, like, like we're co-founders. So we created this code as a way to communicate so that if people are out of code, all you have to do is just say the code and they're not going to fight it because they signed it. Like they've agreed to this being the code. And it's not just a code for who they are here, it's, it's who they are in, in life. So I'll share it. It's a great model for, for your audience. Every company needs this. 
And it's not like a code that we put on our website. It's not for that purpose. It's a way for people to communicate where no one is on the defense ever and they've already agreed to it. So like, for example, one of them is timing of the essence. So like if somebody says they're gonna do something, but they don't deliver in the time frame that they say, all we have to say is, hey, timing's of the essence. And they're, they got it. Like, there's like, it's not a debate. It's not a he said, she said. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. I signed that code. And as a result, I have to deliver. So yeah, I'll, I'll share. I, I really think it's a great example for everybody to see. Yeah, and we'll, we'll put it uh, the link in the, uh, the show notes below. Uh, so if you guys are you know going on a jog or seeing this on YouTube or whatever, you can always come back to it and uh, read through it. That's super cool. 10,000 freaking tech companies in 10 years. Do you guys have a thermometer up on the wall? Like, you know, when in raising money, when you're raising capital, you have this thermometer and it's like, oh, we're going up. Do you have something like that for 10,000 yeah. businesses? We have a dashboard because we're all remote. So, yeah. um, so I mean, the team is literally everywhere, yeah. which is awesome. Um, I'll share a cool thing I've never shared publicly, but I'll share it here. But yeah, we have a dashboard that shows all of the data and there's all different screens. Here's what we're going to do though. I want us to be everywhere, but not tied down anywhere. And that's a really important value in my life. Yeah is that I want geographical freedom. So like, for example, I shared, I was living in Westport, Connecticut, COVID hit, COVID stole every freedom from a parent in Westport, Connecticut. We sold everything. And one week later we were living in Naples, Florida. That's geographical freedom. Like I didn't have to think twice. I didn't have to like, it just, just did it. Like, and people are like, well, that's just cause you've set up your life that way. Correct. I set up my life that yeah. way. That was a conscious decision to have that type of lifestyle. And I'm not nomadic. Like, like we, we set up our life in Naples then. So it wasn't like we were just like going and, and moving around. Like we, we put them into school. Like we, we, we set up our life there. So, um, but one of the things that I stand for is I don't want an entrepreneur to ever feel like they're on an island by themselves, whether they're in our ecosystem or not. And that's a really dark place. Like I remember for me, when I realized that the software development firm um, wasn't able to do it, right? It was so freaking dark. I was like 26 years old. I personally funded this. So at that time I put in 750 already, $750,000 already. And then I heard from them, they needed a year and a half and, and one and a half million dollars more. Who do I talk to about that? Like this is years ago. There wasn't like access to entrepreneurship and coaching that didn't exist this is, this is years ago so i had a new girlfriend that is now my wife so i could talk to her about it my parents <laughs> definitely couldn't handle it yeah. I, I had team members because i was running a marketing agency they were completely unqualified to have a conversation i had my friends tell me i was crazy because i had this eight-figure agency and i'm like pivoting it to this completely unproven SaaS model they're like what are you doing like i'm like i'm going for it all they're like what do you mean i'm like i have a good business but good isn't good enough. I'm going for it all. And I'm willing to risk good for it all. And I'm going to bridge that chasm through hard work and persistence and certainty. And so I did, right? So, um, but one thing I do stand for is I want to create <laughs> physical hubs in, e <coughs> in every major city. Project 10K Miami, Project 10K Scottsdale, Project 10K uh, Tacoma, Washington, Project 10K Barcelona. And here's why. Think about the Chamber of Commerce, like what the Chamber of Commerce has done, right? Or BNI, right? They've created these like networking organizations for small business owners to come together. And that's cool. Like it creates this sense of belonging. But what's freaking cooler than a tech hub in every major city? So now people in St. Louis can congregate. The accredited investors can congregate. People interested in tech can congregate. There's meetings each week, each month. And the, what here's the genius of it though, where it's not about the meeting. It's about the fact that we're now bringing the infrastructure that we've built, which is crazy, into these zip codes where there is none. Like there's no infrastructure to actualize the napkin. Like there's no infrastructure there. So we had somebody pitch us yesterday in this little town in Kansas. I'm like, what's the closest city to you? I can't remember what he said. And I'm like, is there a tech scene? He's like, yeah, they're just, they're not congregating. And I'm like, that's my point. Like this guy would be completely unfound if we weren't doing what we were doing because no one's investing in this, this dude in Kansas, like in this little zip code, there's about a hundred miles away from him. There's a city that, that has like this little budding tech scene that no one knows about. Like who knows about the tech scene in Kansas? Like, like no one knows about that. There needs to be a project 10 K in that city, which is the central hub that brings people together so they can collaborate, ideate, and find all the napkins in the surrounding area to then bring through the model so we can then co-found those companies, get them funded by the local accredited people that want to support local entrepreneurship, and then launch them through the ecosystem. I've never talked about that publicly, by the way. 
Nice. Thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate that. Uh, which is funny. I mean, you're, you, I, I was writing on my, we do work with the Chamber and Local Economic Development Council. So I was like, oh, make sure you share this idea with Jared afterwards. You should build an incubator or some type of tech hub in the city. Oh, here, awesome. build it here in Ocala. We'll help. But <laughs> you're you're ahead of the game. One detail ahead of me. So um, as you're building this, right, you know, you, you said you can invest in our, our companies, right? Like a portfolio company, or you can invest in the company as a whole, 10 K as a whole. What does that look like? Right? So like, when did you decide to take outside capital? What did that look like? You know, who gets yeah. to play in that game with you? So when I launched part of 10 K, I self-funded it. Um, and that was my plan. Like I'm, I'm just going to self-fund it. I had four friends very early on, like within the first couple of weeks that were begging me to get involved. Three of them are, are, pretty big hedge fund managers. And then one is in the health industry. And they're like, we got to get involved. This is so exciting. And I really didn't know what they could do. Like they're, they're like, they could help at the later stage, but not at the napkin stage. So I'm like, why don't you guys just invest? Like, I, I love them. I want them to be successful with this. Like they're already successful. So I'm like, why don't you invest? So they put in a million dollars through the, between the four of them, which was great. It was a million dollars less than I, than I was going to put in. Um, and then we just, I continued to sell fun besides for that. And then um, about 10 months ago, a gentleman named Grant Cardone, who your audience might have heard of, he's a very large real estate investor. He has a $5 billion real estate fund, huge social media following. Uh, he's kind of like an icon in the entrepreneurship industry, for lack of better words, heard about me. And his exact words were, this dude is crazy or he's onto something, but I got to meet him. So he invited me out to his office um, about 10 months ago. He's right here in Miami. And uh, we met, we hit it off. And he said, Jared, I have to get involved with this project which is really a big statement because he's kind of like a contradiction to what we do in the sense that he literally tells people on stages in front of tens of thousands of people, don't invest in anything you can't touch. Like that's it. He's a real estate guy. Like he buys multifamily developments. He has 15,000 doors. Don't invest in anything you can't touch. We build software solutions. So when he's like, I want to get involved, I was thinking to myself, like, what is he going to do? In addition, he's polarizing. People love him or, or they hate him, but universally, Everybody knows Grant Cardone is a great investor because there's not many people that have invested their way to become a billionaire. Not many, like Buffett has, like, but most have like sold something and that's how they got there. He truly is just a self-made invested his way to become a billionaire. So I'm sitting in his office and I'm thinking to myself, what could he do with me? And I'm like, Grant, why don't you invest in the project? So he's like, I'm in. So he actually made a, a big investment into Project 10K. And then he said, but I want to do more with you. And I'm like, all right, what do you have in mind? He goes, I want to launch an initiative with you called 10X Incubator, where I'll go out to my following, which is tens and tens of millions of people, and I'll say, hey, you got a tech idea on a napkin? Fill out this form. And that form is actually Project 10K. So he literally becomes a referral source and brings deal flow through. And then any company we end up saying yes to, he gets a little bit of equity in that individual company, which is great because once the company is ready, he'll promote it because he has equity in it. So that's a home run for the founder, for us, for Grant. We've launched seven other versions of that at the time of this recording with other people like Grant and also country versions. We want Israel, Dominican Republic. So, so we're going to places where there's, there's, there's the need for, for infrastructure. So, but to answer your question on fundraising, so every individual company, we get them funded um, through a sequence of events. For the first time, we are actually doing a, a fundraise at the Project 10K level. And I'm doing this for a very distinct purpose. I was on a podcast um, probably about four months ago, and the host said to me, if I could grant you one wish that would guarantee that you produce your outcome, what would it be? Because the outcome is big. Build, scale, sell 10,000 tech companies in 10 years. And my response without even thinking was, I just want more people to care about what we're doing. And he's like, wow, that's a great response. I'm like, yeah, I know it is. And then I started thinking to myself, what do I mean by that? Like, how do I objectify care? So five years ago, I wrote an article called the 10 by 10 formula. And the 10 by 10 formula states that 100 of the right people um, from diverse backgrounds can solve any problem they're exposed to because of their knowledge, their relationships, and their financial capital. And there's actually data to support this concept, but I've wanted to prove this myself. I just haven't had the right conduit to do it through until recently. So about three weeks ago for the time of this recording, I launched an initiative uh, called 100 Changemakers. 100 Changemakers is a C-Corp that has 100 shares. Each of the shares is $100,000. When we invite somebody to purchase a share, if they say yes, their investment 
is directly into Project 10K, which already has 140 companies and will have 10,000 in the next 10 years. So there will never be a more diversified tech portfolio than us, but it's more than just that. It's the village of people that care. And what we're doing with this village is we're introducing them to our companies. And whenever any of the change makers can serve a company, support them in any capacity that's objective, we will give them more equity in the individual companies. So if you, as an example, Josh, have a, a relationship that you could introduce to one company that produces $1.4 million of revenue, like you'll get more equity in that individual company because we want you to care about that company because it all comes out to people caring. Once a year, we're going to host a summit, bringing all the change makers together and all of our founders, making literally magic happen on the spot. So I literally started this three weeks ago. I made a list of people that I've known as early as high school until more recent that met the three criteria. Uh, the most basic is that they're an accredited investor because I have no choice. Uh, the next is that they're they're deeply, deeply integrous. Like they're just a good human that I would want to do this with. And the third is they absolutely love entrepreneurship. Like they are fanatical about it. So I have a list of 427 people uh, that, I, that I know, like I well, and I started calling them. And I've called about 60 people in, in the three weeks since I started this. And uh, 51 of them said, if you don't give me a spot, I'll never talk to you again, which I knew that they would say that. Like, it, this really is pretty darn exciting. Um, so we officially got the investor documents on Good Friday. So we started sending them around. And I'm, I'm sure between 30 to 51 of them will, will fully, fully commit. And then I'm stopping. And I'm actually not going to keep calling my other 400 people. And here's why. I want to leave some room open for the organic connections that I have. Because I was at an event on Monday and Tuesday of this week, and I met two people that are awesome. And I invite them both to join. They, on the spot, said that they're in. Um, but if I already filled 100 spots, there are literally only 100 chairs. Like This is not like a, a fake sense of urgency. There, there is only 100 spots. And then that's it. So I wouldn't be able to do that. So I want to let like the universe make introductions. And I really want the change makers that say yes, that are in, to make introductions. Like once they're integrated in. Um, and yes, this is our first time doing like an actual fundraise. The use of funds is to uh, build our infrastructure faster. Um, we're going to start acquiring mature infrastructure, software development firms, marketing agencies, UI, UX firms, because the higher individual talent just takes too long. Acquiring this infrastructure is way faster. So that's the use of funds. And then we are setting up funds to actually get the companies funded through family offices, existing funds, high net worth. The one rule is if someone's committing capital to a fund, they're able to say yes or no, whether or not they want to write a check, but they can never say no because it's too early. If they ever say that, we won't show them any more deals. They can say no because of the person or their idea, but they can never say it's too early because I don't believe too early. Everything started on a napkin, everything. I guarantee you that anybody listening right now, if they were able to put $25,000 into Tesla, when it was on a napkin, you'd be pretty darn excited that you did. So everything starts there, like everything. We're just finding it there and we're increasing the likelihood that it actually becomes what it's meant to be in the world. Yeah, dude. Awesome. 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 As you're going through this, what's your greatest fear? The greatest fear. Um, it's interesting. So I, I, I wrote about this recently. So I don't have any fears around this. And, and, and I think part of it is I... I'm, I, I know why. I am so clear on my values. Yeah. So in theory, what it would be if I wasn't is my greatest fear is that this would take over and my kids wouldn't know me. But I am like, I am so clear on my values that that won't happen. And my ultimate goal with this, because my mom asked me this recently, a few months ago, she goes, how will you know when you made it? And I said, I'll know when I made it when no one even knows I started it. So I have no ego. Like, like, like zero, like I don't need credit. I just want my wife and my kids just to love me and think I'm the world to them, but I don't need any of it. I just want to up level and uplift the 10,000 co-founders, my team, the investors in the company, the investors in the individual portfolio companies. So I don't have any fears in what I'm doing because I know I'm going to pull it off. Like, cause I, I'm already pulling it off. Now it's just opening the funnel. So more deals flow through. Um, I figured out the unknowns and I'm sure there'll be more unknowns. But I'm always one detail ahead and I'm not worried about this getting into the way of the stuff that matters most, all it's going to do is create more bandwidth and capacity for that. And, and I'm really health conscious. So like, I, I really put my body first, like, like to the, to the nth degree. So I don't have that fear either. Like, like, like what if something happens with my health? Like I, like that's, that would just be really bad luck. Cause like I am insanely health conscious. So I'm doing everything right to fuel the machine to enable this to happen. Super cool. All right. I've got some questions right here on these cards. Sure. I'm going to shuffle them. You tell me when to stop. 
and we're going to ask you one of these questions. Stop. This is your question. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Have you ever had to break up with a friend? What was the reason? Yeah. Like, so I don't publicly declare it. I just let it naturally evolve. So I, I realized that, so until you asked that question, I'm really health conscious, like exceptionally, and, and not just with my food and my exercise, like it's the information that comes into my mind. Like I'm, I'm very, very aware. Um, and I realized like years ago, I'm like, how is it possible that I would invest so much money, time, energy, and effort into, into this temple right here, yet I allow negative, toxic people in totally. really easily. Like, I'm like, that makes no sense. Like, I, like I won't eat anything with food. Diet. Like I won't eat anything that's not organic. Like, like I'm like, I'm really intense with this, but I'm letting like toxic people into my like small minded thinkers. Like, so I just create boundaries and I don't ever let them inside. I don't know if they're in there, they flick out quickly, but it's not like a conversation. It's just, it just naturally evolves to that point. But I do it often because there's no space for it. Yeah. Um, I am learning, 40 years old, I'm learning to start setting up boundaries, right? So negativity affects me hard. Uh, yeah. Poor emotional, like, uh, intelligence, like, affects me, right? So, like, I want to be around people who, you know, love God and love people and who are uplifting, who are encouraging, right? Oh, you got an idea? Cool, man. What can I do to help? I might not understand it. I'm, I'm here to help, right? And there's people out there who are like, they'll just shit on your idea. They'll shit on your dreams or whatever. And I'm just like, I'm, I'm getting better at creating boundaries. What advice do you have for me there? Don't negotiate with the boundary. Just never negotiate with it. Like you establish it, the yeah. boundary always wins. Like most people negotiate with their boundaries. Like one boundary might be, I'm gonna go to the gym every morning until the alarm goes off and they negotiate with it. And they're like, oh, I'll sleep for another 20 minutes. And then they can't go, right? Just don't negotiate with the boundary. Like when you establish the boundary, the boundary always wins. And that's how I do it. Like, and I actually picture in my mind, like I see boundaries and I'm like, what, they're, they're stepping over the boundary. Like, I'm like, what do you get out of here? Like the boundary always wins. Just don't negotiate with it. Just get really clear. And the other part too is, and this is where I think a lot of people, especially now with what's going on with the world, like people have a hard time saying that they were wrong or changing their mind. So they, they hold so firm on a stupid thesis. Yeah. And like, it's like, just abandon it. You were wrong. Like, it's okay though. So I change my mind all the time. Like all the time, like, like, I mean, like a lot where the team's like, you just said the exact opposite thing yesterday. I'm like, so what? I changed my mind. Like I changed my mind. Like, and they're like, oh yeah, I guess so. And it gives them the permission to realize they can change yeah. their mind. Cause I'd rather them change their mind yeah. than hold on to a thesis doesn't freaking work. Like, yeah. and we live in a world right now where like, like if people were just honest with themselves, they realize that their thesis for two years, like it just didn't work. And they're just holding on to it still. How much longer are you going to hold on to it? Just change your mind. It's okay. Like just change your mind. So yeah, so I just, I firm boundaries and I give myself permission to change my mind whenever I want. Uh, a guy who does this really well, JP Spears, he has a YouTube channel and yeah. he talks about things, but he used to be really big against gun control. Yeah. And then he came out with a new video and he's like, I was wrong. Yeah. Here's why. Like, and he, and he looked back and I, so I, I really respected that because I think a lot of people will hold on to their idea. They'll hold on to something. I stood for vaccines or no vaccines or this or that or whatever they hold on to them they're willing to die for that idea that they held on to even though they might be wrong or they might have changed their mind and that's ego how have you always been low ego or is that something that you've chip away at you keep it on a leash how do you deal with it always always low so i i was really popular when i was younger because i was the best athlete in the school um but I always was like the person trying to lift everybody else up. Like I didn't need or want the attention. I'm like this really weird introvert extrovert thing where you could put me on stage in front of 40,000 people with zero preparation and say, Jared, you got the whole day, do your thing. And I'm completely comfortable. I'm in the elevator with one person. I'm on my phone with you now. Like, I just like, I'm this weird introvert extrovert. I don't need the, I don't need the attention. I don't need the credit. Like it doesn't fuel me. It doesn't drive me. I just feel really good about who I am. So that has been work, like to feel that secure in who I am. Yeah. Um, and I owe it all to my parents' vicious divorce because at a very young age, it forced me to become self-aware with my feelings because mm -hmm. there are a lot of divorces and I'm sure a lot of divorces worse than my parents, but they pretty much did everything you could do wrong within a divorce. And they're, and they're great people individually, just 
terrible together. So just young age, I'm like immersing myself and trying to understand my emotion. Why do I react certain ways? Like, why are they reacting? I got really big of personal development, like early, like, like when I was 10, like reading like Tony Robbins, like probably understood very little of it, but just, just, um, just, it felt right to me. So yeah, I just, I don't have ego. I don't need the attention. I don't want the attention. I know how to get the attention though. So I'm also very aware of the fact that like right this minute, I'm damn good at getting attention. Like I get attention from everywhere for what we're doing and I'll keep doing it until I can up level everybody else. So they're just getting the attention for me. I'll give you a really good example. So Grant Cardone talks about this whole premise of becoming omnipresent. And I've been talking about this for like a decade. So when I met him and he, he's used that word, I'm like, I've never heard of anybody using that word but me. I'm like, what do you mean by it? He goes, well, omnipresence means that you just show up everywhere. I'm like, well, how do you cause that? And he goes, I show up everywhere. I'm like, no, I mean, literally, how do you do it? He's like, I post on Facebook 15 times a day. I do this, I do this. I send out emails. I'm like, see, this is where we differ. Because your version, and not, he's not wrong. It's just, it's just a different approach. His version of omnipresence is to talk about himself a lot. My version of omnipresence is that other people talk about what we're doing. Like, I don't talk about myself a lot. I have other people talking about it. So a great example of this is there's this, there's one thought leader that, that I've been working to create a partnership with, kind of like what we do with Grant. And he's, he's very busy right now. He's in this big launch and he's selling a company and we're not that important yet. And that's my responsibility to get important to him. It's not his responsibility to make me important. So I'm like, okay, cool. I am, it's, it's irrefutable that you're going to do this because I'm omnipresent. He's at speaking at an event uh, in two days with one of our other collaboration partners who's talking about Project 10K from stage. He's then speaking in Las Vegas the week after with another one of our collaboration partners who's talking about Project 10K from stage. I'm at neither venue. I'm not at either of those because I don't need the I don't need the attention or the credit, and that's omnipresence. Other people talking about what we're doing. I guarantee you, he's gonna text me after the second event and be like, "Dude, you're everywhere," and I'm playing with my kids, and my with my wife. Yeah. So that's so, boundaries. That's boundaries. Though. Like that. That is it. Like that. I architected that because I'm like I don't want to be the road warrior. I want to be at home. Like I want to be with my family. Like so. I so some would say like, oh. Jared, that's just, you're lucky. I'm not lucky. I architected that outcome. Like I it was clear on my boundary, but I still want it all. I want presence on every stage around the world. I just don't want to be the one going to it. Like, <laughs> yeah. so I want other people to go to it. I'll pick the ones I want to go to and I'll bring my family to those venues, but I want other people on those stages who are looking for that. And they actually see joy out of getting the attention. I just don't need it. Yeah. Strengths and weaknesses. What would you say is your greatest strength in the, in the business world, greatest weakness? Um, I am an extraordinary, like I know how to deploy influence. So like, I, I really know how to sell and I will only do it when I know that what I'm selling to somebody is going to get them to where they want to get to faster, or I just won't do it. Cause it's, it's, it's like a superpower. Like, like I could do it. Like I always tell people all the time, like if I didn't have integrity, I'm better than Bernie Madoff. Like, like I could do that. Like I would never do it. Like I have deep integrity. I have values. So I know I really know how to deploy influence my weakness um, in, in, in business, in business or in life, which, which is it? Yes. I have a terrible <laughs> sense me. of direction, this, which is actually my strength. But I'll tell you what, I, a terrible. Like I, I, I literally have no sense of direction. And I always think whatever direction I'm looking at is north, always, which means I'm always going up. So it actually has served me in life. But, but I, have a ter I really have a bad sense of direction. But on the business side, I can't do anything administrative. So like the, uh, I have a great team that supports this, but I, I messaged my director of operations yesterday because somebody on my team's health insurance card for some reason ended up on my desk. And I'm like, you gotta just order them a new card. Like the thought of me figuring out what to do with that piece of mail to get it to this person on my team is like kryptonite. Cause I have to like put it in an envelope, <laughs> write their address, put a stamp on, find them. Like, I just can't do it. Like literally can't do it. So I'm like, just order a new card. She's like, Jared, it takes three seconds. I'm like, no, that's the difference. It takes you three seconds. For me, it's like an hour and a half and I get lost when I drive to the post office. So like, it's not happening. So yeah, yeah. that's my weakness. That's, I don't do anything administrative. That's super yeah. funny. I am very similar. Worst sense of direction ever. And what's funny is I used to drive fire trucks and ambulances and such like that. So like, you know, I got lost and yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't for me. Um, <laughs> that didn't work out too good. Uh, the, as you're building this, build, scale, sell. 10,000 businesses on the sell part. So at the end of 10 years, I, I know that there's going to be some overlap, but you're going to see a lot of things leave your portfolio and you're going to sell them. How do you think you're, how do you think that's going to affect you all around? 
So we we have some founders that are like, well, I'll do build scale. I'm not selling. I'm like, all right, that's cute. Like you're going to like, trust me <laughs> because there's a certain point where it's not as fun. Like yeah. it just starts to get arduous. So we, there's this premise called the Peter principle and the Peter principle states that um, every business will grow to the capacity of their leadership. And the yeah. only way to expand past that is to bring on new leadership or to sell. And the leadership that we look at is our co-founder. Like that's the leadership we're referring to because we know our capacity is limitless. We're always bringing on great talent. So it's like, what is their Peter principle? So there's eight non-negotiable criteria that every founder must have in order to, for us to say yes. And it's not just on day one. It's like, they have to, they have to expand that criteria as we expand. And there's a point in time where like one of them is they have to be able to sell. Like if they, if their skill as a salesperson plateaus, at a certain point in time, we either have to hire somebody else to fill that leaky bucket, like the leak in the bucket, or we have to sell the company. And it's an unemotional thing because our commitment, our fiduciary responsibility is to create optimal impact with every single company. That's our responsibility. So there's no ego here. Like if there's a certain point in time that we're no longer the right partner, like we're like our software development team, it has plateaued, like their skill has plateaued for that per that individual venture then they're not going to work on it anymore. We have to either go out and hire somebody or sell the company to salesforce.com or Amazon or something else that has infrastructure with regard that we don't have. So there's just, it's unemotional. There's just a point in time where they sell and that's the next evolution of that impact. Hmm. As you're, as you're building this and as you, you know, your kids are going to grow up. So they're three and five. So they'll be 13, 15, you know, um, is there a specific financial model you want to hit before, before you exit the business? So, or, or bringing a different leader to take your role? <laughs> it's not an economic thing so much. Like, cause I'm good right now. Cause like, it's like, I just, I just have to know what happens. So like, and I don't care in the end, if I have 3% of the company, like it doesn't matter. I just have to know that I was called to do this and we did it. But I also know we're not going to stop at 10,000 because that's when it's going to get easy. Like, like I think at, at like a few hundred, we're going to see it's easy. So it's like, I'm, I'm confident we'll have tens of thousands. Like, like there's, there's no end to this. There's an end to me as a leader of it because someone else will take the baton and then run with it. But I can't see this stopping because why would we stop at 10? At that point, our infrastructure is going to be nuts. We're going to be building like robots. Like we're going to do crazy stuff. Like we're doing like simple software now, that's not even that simple. Like we're going to, we're going to take on every innovation that exists because we built the infrastructure and we have the economical power to do it. So it's not a number for me. It's a realization that my Peter principle kicked in and that I don't have the desire to go with it, but I have the desire to ensure we produce the outcome. Yeah. So we, we're, we're coming up on our, on our time. I think we'll, we'll have some more conversations, especially 10 years from now. I'll, I'll re-interview you. We'll, We'll be a little older, a little bit more gray hair in this in this guy's beard. <laughs> but uh, two questions that come to mind is, what questions should I have asked you during this interview that I screwed up to didn't ask you? Now we'll get into contact information and such later on, so don't don't use that up there. What questions should I have asked you, business life or whatever that I screwed up did not ask you? So, what's driving me to do this? Um, because there really is like a deep deep drive here and. I kind of I answered it before just because I wanted to get there with you, which is this whole premise of most people will die with their greatness inside and almost no one will experience having it all in life for their own choices. Like very few do, like, like a fraction of a fraction do. And I'm like, why? Like, why does that have to be the norm? Like, why can't we redefine new norms? Like, why do people believe that you have to give, give away this to get that? Like, why can't you just have a book? Like, why, why do you have to pick and choose? It really drives me though. Because like, there's even people in my family that are like compromising because that's what they think is normal. And I'm like, why, why? Like, why do you feel like, why can't you architect exactly what you desire? And a part of it is economics. And I do know that being a tech founder, when you dial in the right idea and the right market and the right business model produces incredible economics, which is a piece of having it all. The other part of it is being non-negotiable with your boundaries, being so freaking clear on your all. And then that's just it. So it drives me. Cause like, what does the world look like when that happens? Like, what if I'm crazy enough to pull that off? Like, what if, like, what if there's 10,000 
10,000 entrepreneurs that are living it all. So their kids see it, their grandbabies see it. It's like, it just, it's like, it's, it's freaking cas, it's just crazy. Like what that actually evolves into. So that drives me immensely because I've worked hard to get to this point where I could say that I have it all yet. I want so much more and I won't compromise on any of my values. And I want to give other people that chance as well. And it lights with every founder we say yes to when they come through, I'm like, yep, you're on a journey to have it all. Like, like you might think you're on a journey to build scale inside your company, but you're on a journey to have it all. And that's what we're going to do together. When has that cost you deeply when you're like, I will not compromise on my values. When has that been put to the test and it cost you? Like strategic partnerships where people that I did stuff with that had a different definition for integrity than I had, and it could have created very strong economics. And I just ended it like, and I just wouldn't do it. It was like, in my mind, I'd go home all night and my son or daughter would be like, I'm not proud of you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't even imagine that. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end it. That's a boundary thing. Now I'm confident by ending it, it produced more elsewhere that maybe I haven't even realized yet, but that was, that was intense. I mean, COVID was intense. I mean, I have very strong beliefs on health, like very strong. And that was now up for discussion. So as a result of me having strong beliefs on health, there are people that were intimately involved in my life that are now not, not because of me, like more because of them than for me. Um, but that's a non-negotiable for me, like non-negotiable. I mean, I left family, like to move to Florida, knew nobody here, like didn't look back once, non-negotiable. I will not give up my freedom. Like, and I understand that might mean that my, my, my kids don't have active grandparents in their life, which is sad, but what's, what's way worse is giving up your freedom because that's a non-negotiable for me. Yeah. Well, welcome to the great country of Florida. That's where we go. Land of the free, baby. That's it. <laughs> we love this place. Yeah, we're here in Florida as well. Um, where can people go to connect with you and do a deal with you? Project10k.com. Head over there. Check it out. The number 10, project10k.com. You'll see we have a list of our portfolio companies. We have a thing called the faces of Project 10K. I'm very proud of this. This goes into the question my mom asked me, which is like, well, we know you made it. I'm like, well, no one even knows I started it. That's the faces of Project 10K. We show the faces of everybody, everybody in our team, our co-founders, the people that are investing in the companies, our company, like it's the faces of Project 10K. We have a daily show that we do. You can learn more about that there, but just go there right now. Listen, for your audience, go there right now and execute on your biggest idea. Don't be like everybody else that just goes to the graveyard with their potential. Don't be like most people that are complaining that somebody else launched Uber, but it was their idea. The difference was they executed on it. Execute on your greatest idea. Never let somebody else execute on your dream, but you. So go over, it's project10k.com. Fill out the application, we'll review it, and I hope to see you on the show so we can potentially co-found a tech company together. Sweet. And you can find out probably more of the details of the how it all works. We don't want to get too deep in the weeds here, but uh, that, that's a good place where they could kind of fill, figure that all out, yeah, yeah. right? Cool. Very comprehensive, yeah. Awesome. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow deal makers, thanks for listening into this episode. Wow, what an awesome goal, man. That's big. It's crazy. It's scary. I love it. If it's not making you a little nervous, then it might not be big enough, you know? So uh, let's cheer him on as we see him build scale, sell 10 businesses, 10,000 10, tech companies. Yeah, dude, go for it. Um, if you're working on a deal, looking for a deal, or want to talk about it here on the show, head on over to the dealscout.com, fill out a quick form, maybe get you on the show next. Till then, talk to you all on the next episode. See you guys.